Ms. Landsman, seconded by Mr. Mantupatar, moves that Bill C-353, an act to provide for the imposition of restrictive measures against foreign hostage takers and those who practice <coughs> arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations and to make related amendments to the proceeds of crime, money laundering, and terrorist financing act and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act be now read a second time and referred to the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development. Develop, uh, debate the Honourable Member for Thornhill. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's a first for me as I stand here to speak to my own private member's bill, the Foreign Hostage Takers Accountability Act. And I'll start with the fact that we are very blessed to live in a nation at which in its core values human rights, justice, equality, and the rule of law. These are the principles that define who we are as a people, the story we have written thus far, and the kind of country that we want to protect and, frankly, build up. These are also the principles that are shared by many, but they are certainly not universal or even widespread around the world. There are still many places today where basic human rights are not recognized, where they are under attack, and where simply being a Canadian can put you in grave danger. When I proposed this legislation, the events of October 7th were not even within the realm of imagination. The brutal attack and subsequent hostage-taking by Hamas terrorists of innocent civilians on a holiday Saturday have cast an undeniable light on the power of hostage-taking, even thousands of miles away. The events we bear witness to almost daily in the news as we watched the slow return or we watched the slow return of innocent civilians who were viciously torn away from their homes and their families, those at least whose fate wasn't outright murder, impact the stability of our own country and the course of fellow democracies around the world. Virtually every democratic administration on the U.S. side of the border, from Carter to Reagan, to here at home, from Harper to our current government, has to cope with the wounds inflicted upon them by state and non-state hostage-taking, which tilted our histories, the histories of both of our nations. The events of October 7th set a new precedent that is being watched very carefully by the most malevolent forces on earth, which happen to despise Canada no less than they do any other democracy of freedom-loving people. There has never been a comparable incident in numbers and in systemic nature, which has involved Canadians, in which hostages as young as 10 months old and as old as 85 have been taken in an unusually ruthless way. These hostages have sub subsequently become the focus of international hatred and violence in the streets of, every, of virtually every Western city everywhere in the world. And while the October 7th attack isn't the focus today, it cannot be ignored. The last two months opened a new chapter in hostage-taking that has proven to be a serious security threat in the world, with the power not just to change it for the victims, who must live forever with the consequences and the trauma, but also the internal dynamics of, of sovereign countries. Every malevolent force on earth has taken note of just how much power this hostage-taking has provided for its perpetrators. That's right. How we respond is truly going to matter on how others will act, and our legislation must be adjusted accordingly. In a world that is increasingly authoritarian, increasingly unsafe and, frankly, unstable, the threat of hostage-taking presents a real and pressing danger. Faced with these challenges, the importance of having comprehensive, up-to-date, modern legislation to prevent and mitigate hostage-taking situations must be a priority. It must be something that we think about. 
The truth is, is that most legislation dealing with terrorism generally only comes in the aftermath of the most egregious terrorist events. Virtually every major terrorism-related UN resolution or domestic law was only in response to the specific events which compelled injured international communities into changing the rules regarding terrorism. Every leap in international and domestic law was forced on Western democracies by the imaginative murderers of Al-Qaeda or ISIS or anyone of their ilk. Canada has always and should always rise to defend civil liberties and freedoms wherever and whenever they have been challenged. On the beaches of Normandy, in the jungles of Rwanda, and in the deserts of Afghanistan, we must ensure that we can continue to rise to that occasion. And we must ensure that we can protect the innocent lives and assert our values as a nation. That is why I've introduced this bill. If passed, this, would, this act would strengthen Canada's ability to deter, to minimize, and to resolve instances where Canadians are taken hostage abroad. It would increase government power to levy sanctions, establish more support for families, and provide incentives for global cooperation. It would be a vital tool in Canada's arsenal, helping us continue to protect the lives and the rights of Canadians taken hostage or arbitrarily detained. It would provide valuable support here at home and to the loved ones of hostages who endured long periods of sacrifice and extreme stress. And we have seen that. We have seen that in recent cases. The bill is not a silver bullet by any means to prevent and solve such incidents, but it is a necessary bullet in our arsenal as, democracy in order to, as, as a democracy in order to deal with the bad actors more effectively and to limit the danger that they can inflict on our country. Reviewing a list of Canadian hostages taken abroad in recent years reaffirms this phenomenon. Nigeria, Mali, Pakistan, Haiti, the Philippines, and of course, the one that is in recent memory that affected two Canadians who sat in this gallery, the two Michaels in China. In fact, the Standing Committee on, on Foreign Affairs and International Development studied complex consular cases in 2018, recommending unanimously that Canada should provide greater support to families and hostages and establish a more transparent information sharing structure. Many of those recommendations informed and influenced this bill. I have worked in this space as a staffer in the prior government in the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And what I saw versus what Canada could say and do, there's a gap there. And I've decided to use the time as a parliamentarian here finally in this House to address that gap so that Canadians feel safe wherever and whatever situation they might find themselves in. Many of my colleagues um, reached out to me in recent days with questions, which I take as a positive sign. But if they have questions, it means that others might have questions too. So first, I should make clear that this does not change Canada's current and long-standing policy of not paying ransom. We do not and should not ever provide financial rewards to those who seek to kidnap, imprison, or otherwise harm our citizens. The proposed incentives in this bill are not a repudiation of that principle. Rather, it is an extension from the Foreign Affairs Report that these incentives will promote greater collaboration between government and innocent third parties, NGOs, and others, so that we can do everything possible to bring our loved ones home, to bring our Canadian citizens home. Second, I should say that hostage-taking and arbitrary detention are not the same thing. 
Hostage taking is a form of arbitrary detention. However, it goes further because it includes threats of physical violence or even murder if certain conditions are not met. In other words, the element of extortion is present in hostage taking, and extortion is a grave threat to our entire country. The decisions that we make, how we do business, our governance. Arbitrary de detention in state-to-state -state relationships occurs when an individual is arbitrarily arrested or detained to compel action or exercise leverage of a foreign government. I hope that provides some clarity so that we can move forward into making this a new reality in Canada. I'd also like to thank a few key people and groups who have played a critical role in advancing this idea all the way to the floor of the House of Commons to present to you here, Madam Speaker. First, Sarah Teach and Danny Eisen and Cheryl Sapiri and Stacey Gronofsky for their work on the issue, long-standing work on the issue. This legislation, on be and on behalf of what they do at, uh, secure, at, uh, uh, for Canadians at Secure Canada. Strong advocates such as my friend Erwin Kotler, one of Canada's greatest advocates for human rights. The support from groups like the Iranian Justice Collective, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, Muslims Against Anti-Semitism, the Greater Toronto Kurdish House, synagogues, churches, Hong Kong Watch, the Uyghur Rights Advocacy Project, just to name a few, and of course, my own staff who have, who, have, who have worked on multiple iterations of something that is long in my brain and in the brain of some of my colleagues to make that a reality and bring it through this process. You can never underestimate how much work goes into, into, that, uh, into that process. These organizations, advocacy partners, and our own staff understand that this concept needs to be ensconced in law because that is the way that democracies establish our values and what actually matters. Statements and statements that we've heard over the last number of years simply do not cut it anymore. That's what we've become very good at in this country in far too many instances. I will be slightly crass for, for a moment and say that we don't just declare our objectives to things like child abuse or intimate partner violence. We legislate them. We establish them as truths of our value system through law. And law is the last arena which we, in, in which we have that we can level the playing field against those forces, including the hordes gathering around the world that are currently applauding the dismemberment of babies and the rape and mutilation of women and children, they will inevitably be back to applaud such other atrocities against those they consider deserving. There is simply no way, given the millions of trips that Canadians take every year and the tens of thousands of Canadians living outside of the country, in dangerous places that the government of Canada regardless of its politics, regardless of who sits in that seat, will be left unscathed by this. This bill is about protecting Canada as much as it is about protecting Canadians. It is about protecting the sovereignty of the Canadian government and the lives of Canadian <coughs> citizens. Voting against it will delight the hostage takers around the world. And I ask this House to please not give them that satisfaction, particularly after what we have seen in the last two months around the world. Every Canadian deserves to be safe and secure. They deserve a government who can help them when things go wrong. And anything that we can do to make that a reality, I think is worth doing. And anything that we can do to make sure that we bring Canadians home safely, needs to be done. And I hope that all of my colleagues from across all parties will support this legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker.